So this week's lecture is based on economic geography and this is our last lecture for the semester. So economics is fundamental to an understanding of society. Space, distance, and location are each critical to understanding economic functions. Now what is Marxism, historical materialism? Well, Marxism is a social, economic, and political philosophy that analyzes the impact of the ruling class on the laborers leading to uneven distribution of wealth and privileges in the society. And historical materialism is based on that history is made as a result of struggle between different social classes rooted in the underlying economic base. And economic determinism is the same type of concept as the other determinisms we went through throughout the lecture. Well, it's a socio-economic theory that economic relationships are the foundation upon which all other societal and political arrangements in society are based on. So what is autarky? <clears throat> If a location is unable or unwilling to buy and sell with outsiders in the global economy, it must therefore be able to supply all of its own needs. Economic policy known as autarky that requires a region to achieve complete economic self-sufficiency. Since almost no group of people is able or willing to live without goods and services from beyond their borders, nearly every group trades local products for imported ones. And what is the difference between basic industries versus non-basic industries? Well, basic industries export to consumers outside of the area, while non-basic industries cater to consumers within the same area. Examples of basic industries are oil extractions in Saudi Arabia and Texas, and an example of non-basic industries are dentist offices. Now let's look at the primary sector. So traditionally, communities create economies from the ground up. Examples of extractive industries are farming, mining, fishing, logging, or other extractive industries that pull wealth from the earth are the basis for many local and national economies. So extractive industries make up the primary sector of the economy. And extractive industries are key to national wealth and it often spurs manufacturing. But also it could be detrimental to the environment. Extractive industries have a negative impact on the environment. The extractive sector contributes to air, water, and land pollution, as well as toxic waste and has caused significant water pollution. And an example we have here in Los Angeles, while Los Angeles remains the largest urban oil field in the country, and there are thousands of active oil wells in the greater LA. And this does have an impact, a neg negative impact on the community, and you will be discussing what type of impacts it does have on the community that live nearby these oil wells. So the secondary sector industries take materials extracted by workers in the primary sector and manufacture them into useful products. For example, um, the, from the primary sector you have fresh fish, fresh fish, and then in the secondary sector you manufacture the fresh fish into fish so because manufacturers convert items with little use value, like logs, into something with greater use value, like turning the log into a dining room table, manufacturing activity often generates large unit profits or value added per unit. And factors of production. Well, land, labor, and capital traditionally make up the main cost of building and running any business. This is especially evident for manufacturers. Together, these costs are known as the factors of production. And the process of picking a location for a factory is known as industrial 
site location analysis, and it is a very profitable career path for economic geographers. And companies that need mostly low-skilled laborers generally seek locations with a low cost of living because workers in such locations accept lower wages. Industries that move easily without negative consequences to their profitability are called footloose industries. The textile industry is a classic example. So for free trade, why not just erect trade barriers while that will lead to autarky? In the case of NAFTA, there were also a few instances of job creation in the U.S., even in some manufacturing sectors. NAFTA brought some manufacturing jobs from Mexico to the U.S. For example, Cummins, a manufacturer of diesel engines for large trucks in Mexico prior to NAFTA. After the free trade agreement eliminated the Mexican import tariffs on American-made engines, Cummins closed their factory in Mexico and production relocated to Jamestown, New York. And essentially, the logic behind the principle of comparative advantage forces countries engaged in free trade to specialize in the production of goods they produced, produced most efficiently. And now let's get into containerization, which are intermodal containers. Well, intermodal containers were invented in the 1950s, and these simple metal boxes revolutionized the shipping industry and affected competition in the manufacturing sector. These containers were designed to be easily filled with cargo stacked quickly upon one another, thereby reducing the cost of shipping. And hundreds of thousands lost their manufacturing jobs to overseas competition because the cost of transporting goods from places like China or Mexico fell so dramatically that goods coming from foreign factories now have shipping costs similar to goods produced locally. The cost of land is another major consideration for those who want to build a factory. Not every location is suitable for manufacturing. You have to look at factors such as distance, the cost, and accessibility. And factories remaining in crowded inner city neighborhoods also often suffer from spatial diseconomies of scale because trucks access is difficult and slow. Taking delivery of materials and shipping finished goods over congested street networks and or jammed freeways increases costs and reduces profits. Locations near uncrowded freeways are ideal because they permit both workers and materials to easily travel to and from a factory. If rail or water transport access is available, then transport options become even more cost effective. So now let's look into the models. Alfred Weber's least cost location model provides site location analysis with a basic tool to evaluate several weighted input considerations. In the most basic version of the model, only transportation costs are considered. Therefore, the best place for a factory is closer to the input or output with the highest transport costs. In the example illustrated here, the factory here is F, labeled as F1, and it's located nearest to supplier S4, which is supplier 4, and because it's closest to that one, the transport costs are highest from that location. Next, let's look into capital. Investment dollars are critical to industry. Investors are necessary for industrialization. Capital comes from investors who may be wealthy individuals, groups, or banks that specialize in investment capital. A special type of investor known as a venture capitalist specializes in making high-risk loans to startup companies in hopes of reaping great rewards if the fledging company makes it big. And governments are a very important source of indirect capital for many companies. And human capital consists of education, health, and culture, as well as women workers. 
Um, the next industry sector we're going to look at is the tertiary industry. And this is a service sector. So you work in the service sector if you transport goods, sell goods, or somehow help others use those goods. And now it's much more important in the United States than before 1970. And this includes retail, research, transportation, communication, utilities, and tourism, and many more. And for workers in some places, manufacturing jobs were replaced by clean, safe, well playing service sector jobs like computer programming that in many regions in the U.S. haven't been so lucky. Workers in those locations were forced to either move or to accept low-paying service sector jobs like working at Walmart. As a result, since the early 1980s, the lower middle class has gotten much smaller while the size of the lower class has exploded. And the wealth of the tiny upper class, or so-called 1%, has skyrocketed. The result is a widening gap between the haves and the haves nots. So, social scientists measure wealth inequality with a statistic called the Gini coefficient, and graphing the change in the Gini coefficient shows how the gap between the rich and the poor has widened over time. And the gap has grown much faster since 1980 as the United States underwent both economic restructuring away from manufacturing and adopted the logic of supply side economics to restructure both the tax structure and how we are spending tax money. So for the Gini coefficient, when it's 0.50 and up, that means it's bad. The Gini coefficient measures inequality on a scale from 0 to 1. Higher values indicate higher inequality. So you can see here the red are the higher values, and we could see on the map which countries have a higher inequality. Lastly, let's talk about the quaternary sector. Is there another sector? Yes, the information sector. Education, government, and financial planning are part of the quaternary sector, but most of the focus is on high-tech software and information technology jobs. And what are fire industries? Well, fire stands for finance, insurance, and real estate industries. So they have a definite spatial logic. New York City is the headquarters for a lot of companies in this sector, but Chicago, San Francisco, Boston, and other cities have large fire sectors as well. So one of the most useful methodologies available to business geographers is called economic base analysis and it's a, it's a technique devised to determine whether or not any particular economic activity functions as a basic or non-basic industry. A standard mathematical formula called the location quotient is most often used to identify economic bases for places at various scales. In other words, you can learn which industries in the local economy are bringing in money from the outside and which serve mostly a local population. And here you could see the formula for the location quotient. Anything over 1.0 indicates a surplus. And for retail site location, 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 location are the three most important words in business, but few business students learn how to do site location analysis. Site location analysis is a primary job of geographers working in location intelligence jobs, a major source of high quality employment for those with a geography degree. Many companies, including McDonald's, Kohl's, Walmart, and Walgreens, employ geographers to help them select optimal site locations for both retail and warehousing operations. Governments also need geographers to select ideal sites for schools, police department, airports, and fire stations. And these are very good jobs. Next, let's talk about hoteling model. 
Harold Hotelling developed the most basic site location model in the late 1920s. It is useful for understanding some basic patterns of retail in many cities. Hotelling's basic premise was that when competing firms sell a similar product, customers will travel the shortest distance possible to purchase that product. Since competitors frequently sell products that are virtually dis indistinguishable from each other, such as gasoline, aspirins, Coca-Colas, the behavior of customers creates an incentive to agglomerate at a point that maximizes the potential number of customers. So like we'll see here in the hoteling model. On this infographic, the logic of the hoteling model plays out in a series of moves and counter moves by competitors arranged in a linear market like a street or on a beach. Here in this example, you can see this is Main Street and we have Amy's firm here and Joe's firm. And we could see the moves that Amy makes. She moves to the east, capturing Joe's market share. And then Joe moves to the west, capturing Amy's market share. And then we have the final equilibrium here. And under this logic, after a series of moves and counter moves, the state of equilibrium will be reached that finds firm A, which is Amy's firm and Joe's firm located next to each other, like we see here, with each firm capturing nearly 50% of the customers. Next, we have the Huff model. Another of the measures frequently used by retail site location analysts is the Huff model. And this is a more complex model to predict spatial behavior of customers. Again, bigger stores such as malls attract more customers and closer stores such as malls attract more customers as well. And distance discourages shopping. And here we have the formula of the Huff model. Next, we have marketing geography. So business geographers are also are very good at helping companies identify customers and sell products. Spatial an analysts equipped with sophisticated databases about customers' income, lifestyles, and shopping tendencies can identify locations where marketing dollars can be most wisely spent, as well as where advertising urban stores dollars are wasted. Um, we could take an example of landscape geography with the Corona. Alcohol advertisements are especially fond of using landscapes to see beer, wine, and liquor. Corona's beer's longtime marketing campaign is a classic example. Corona ads never tell you the beer tastes great, but only try to get you to imagine yourself on a secluded tropical beach. So they are selling place to sell the product. Place product packaging. Um, many chain stores use what geographer John Jackal calls place product packaging to help sell goods and services. Essentially, the goal of a place product packaging is to customers, customers to visit chain or franchise stores repeatedly by using the architecture and landscape of the store itself. Chain restaurants started this practice first in the 1950s. And what could you eat? What could you once eat at the store on the right? Well, this, based on the architecture, looks like a McDonald's. And how do you know this? By using your Jedi goggles. And lastly, let's look at hamburger stands. Landscape and architecture were two potent ways hamburger restaurant owners convinced the public that ground beef was safe and the landscape of hamburger restaurants designed to assure very customers of what well that the ground beef was safe and around 1970 mcdonald's abandoned the hygienic modern look for an environmental themed landscape that featured weathered brick and mansard roofs all painted in brown burnt orange and yellowish earth tones And these are examples of hamburger stands. You could see here on the left, 
This environmental look replaced the glass steel porcelain look of the post-war era around 1970s, only to fall out of favor by 1990s. And the building on the right is an attempt to recover the 1950s look with a 1970s era building with the mansard roof and brick. And then lastly, we have our in and out here. So that's it for this week's lecture. Thank you for watching.